Кохайтеся Чорноброві та не з москалями, бо москалі чужі люди роблять лихо з вами. That is the first um, stanza of a famous poem by our national poet Taras Shevchenko. It is the poem named Katerina, which is my name. And the first stanza says, fall in love, brown-eyed girl, or brown-browed girl. Um, Ukrainians are known for having dark brows and brown eyes. So it says, fall in love, brown-browed girl, but not with a Muscovite, because the Muscovites are strange people and they do bad upon us. And this was written in the 1800s. And this is one of our national poems. I personally find it special to me because it's, it's my name and it tells the journey of a girl, Katerina, who is a Ukrainian living in a Ukrainian village. And when the Russian Imperial Army comes through to her village, she is warned not to fall in love with a Moscow soldier because they are foreign people and they will do bad upon her. But she does. She falls in love with a Moscow soldier, has his child, and he abandons her, goes back to Moscow, and leaves her pregnant with a Russian baby. And the whole poem has a lot of historical significance for Ukraine because it's symbolic of Russian imperialism upon Ukraine and kind of the Russians imposing themselves upon the Ukrainian people just to leave them behind to deal with the consequences. And it's been, even though it's from the 1800s, it's still very historically relevant. And I found the line, you know, don't fall in love with a Muscovite because they're foreign people and they will do bad upon you. That just goes to show that even in the 1800s, we were never the same people. Ukrainians had a conception of their national identity. They knew that they were not the Muscovites, that they were Ukrainians, and that these were two different foreign people. And, you know, another myth perpetuated by Russia that Ukraine has always been a part of the Russian Empire. But no, we've not only always had a sense of our identity, but also this warning of don't trust the Russians. They don't want any good for you and they're going to leave you. Um, is something that Ukrainians have heeded for centuries. I don't really know what I'm doing yet. I have a name, it's called The Shadows Project, and that's pretty much it. But I know I want to do something that helps us take control of our narrative and makes it, makes Ukrainian culture come out of the shadows and make it historically and contemporarily like relevant to us today. And we just chatted and since, since that first call, Shadows has transformed into so many different things, but the mission has stayed the same. It's historical, historical autonomy over the narrative and sharing the hidden sides and repressed sides of Ukrainian culture and reclaiming a lot of it that is not hidden but is obscured as Russian. Every single thing that we said when we started the project, Putin has now done. Because when he declared war on Ukraine, he said, Ukraine is a fake state that doesn't have a right to exist because it was created by Lenin and had never been independent. And Ukrainians and Russians are the same people. And that just goes to show that for, a lot, for the West, this is a breaking conflict that started a week ago that is on everyone's minds. For Ukrainians, we've been thinking about this for centuries, if not in my personal life for years already, where to the fact that even even before any kind of troop buildup, any kind of threat from the Russian side, the three of us sat together and said, there are people out there that don't believe in the existence of the Ukrainian state, and we need to preserve that. The day that the invasion started, I remember Putin was scheduled for a nationwide address at 6.45 PST. And I went to dinner at six. They were serving dinner at my um, dorm. And I was sitting there at dinner and I said, well, I have 45 minutes, so maybe I should shower and put away some of my things because in 45 minutes, the whole world is gonna come crashing down. And so I got up and I showered and I said, you know, in all honesty, I don't know when the next time is going to be that I'm going to be able to get up and shower and take care of myself. So I'm going to do it one last time. I've showered since then, don't worry. 
And um, I said, I'm going to do it one last time. And so I did. I got in bed at 6.40 p.m. I got in bed and I was like, yep, this is where I'm going to be for the next however long. I don't know when I'll get up. And sure enough, I tune into Putin's live stream and he announces that he's launching a special military operation into Ukraine to demilitarize and denazify the country. And that's when I knew that it was over. And I've realized that there is no space between your public Ukrainian self and your private personal self when you can't have the freedom to be your private self. And so that's why I think I have such a personal connection to Ukraine and the Ukrainian land because I felt as though in every decision that I make, you know, whether it's the language I speak, whether it's the music I listen to, the clothes I wear, each of these things are things that need to be protected. The choices that I make need to be protected because there was a time when I couldn't wear this shirt. Um, my grand, my great grandmothers couldn't wear their Vishavankas because of Ukrainian repression. There was a time when I couldn't speak the Ukrainian language because of language repression. And all of these personal choices that I make every day um, can't be my personal choices without protecting, you know, the greater, the greater nation and the nation's choices. So there's been very much a blurring between those two personalities, and I feel as though there's no longer any any personal life in this. It's all, it's all for the nation.